I was coming from a McDonald's. I don't remember how much was my pay per hour. It was probably five pounds, 75, something like that. Hmm. So when they interviewed me, they told me like, okay, we want to take you. How much do you want? And I say $9. And they were like, oh, the minimum is $13. I was like, oh, okay, okay. Let's do $13. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Three years after, I was the leader of eight teams. Wow. All the grammar checkers in, in so I can tell you that, that, that I started as developer for Italian. I became lead for Portuguese, Brazilian, German, Korean, Hungarian. And then they gave me the English one, which is the, of course, the biggest market they have. And I did a grammar checker for English. So this happened in, in the, in a range of five, six years. Wow. Welcome to 99 Humans. My name is Jeff LaCusta, curious coach and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, striving to understand how little things generate big impact. And I'm Nadia Carta, tech executive and lifestyle coach with a mission to transform lives and corporations by kindling hearts to generate a zeal for life. Each week, we investigate stories about the human side of leadership to re-energize your spirit and help you become a stronger leader. Because the reality is that leadership is messy, goofy, challenging, but always human. Thanks for spending time with us today. Let's dive in. Well, hello, Enrico. It is great to have you on 99 Humans. Thanks for being here. Hi, Jeff. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Happy to be here. This, this conversation is one that I've been really looking forward to because uh, you have an incredible list of leadership accomplishments. You know, you're currently the head of human computation at Bloomberg. You've published over 60 papers on AI. You're advising startups. You've spoken at the White House. But I'd summarize all that really is just being super involved, very knowledgeable about AI before AI was cool. And I'm curious, does that sound right to you? Would you agree with that statement? Yes, actually, yes. And I don't know how it happened, to be honest. Um, like when I... When I was uh, going to the university, um, I had this passion for literature, actually. So I said, like, you know what? I'm going to study literature. I wanted to become a writer. I still want to become a writer. Um, and, you know, a writer needs to know the language very well. Uh, you need to be able to understand why certain sentences works better, work better than others, right? So what I thought is, like, you know, from, uh, from, for my master, which was linguistics. And I switched from literature to linguistics. And because when I was uh, younger, I could program. And very few people in humanities can program. So there was this subject that was called computational linguistics. It's very funny because at a certain point, I said, like, hey, you know what? I put together my passion for linguistics and my passion for programming. And let's see what comes out. And it happened that computational linguistics is what today people call NLP, natural language processing. And so I, I enter in Now that's all the rage. And you were, yeah, you were ahead of the game. And I was there in 2009. So I entered in this war in 2008, 2009. Um, I have to say, like, it was at the time I was still unclear where this war was taking me. And in 2012, that's the moment where I wrote my thesis in this, uh, in this subject. And that's where everything started. So I, I, I definitely want to go deeper. Uh, but writer to writer, computational linguistics, AI, this is an extremely hot topic just in and of itself, right? People are going on strike around what AI is going to do to the writing process. When right. you say, I want to be a writer, what's your take on AI helping, hurting, being a, a danger to this career of writing or a help, maybe? You know, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, you know, AI is... Uh... My role in, in Bloomberg is the head of human computation, meaning like uh, I believe in, not in the interaction between machine and humans, but in the collaboration between machine and humans. So there's a point where uh, if we let AI support us, we can be more creative maybe. Uh, for example, now the large language models that everybody speaks about, uh, they are changing a little bit the paradigm in the industry. Before the AI was used only for their repetitive and boring tasks and so on. But now the AI is getting into the marketing and creating the slogans and so on. Um, and do we think that AI will do this on its own? No, of course, we need humans to help AI to improve and make those slogans more effective, more appropriate for the right public, uh, uh, personalized, right, and so on. So um, 
the human and machine collaboration is where uh, probably there's a, there's the sweet spot. That sounds good. And honestly, I've said the same thing uh, to clients and other folks, just to the magic is the human plus the machine. And together, what's possible is amazing. But given your space, I'm wondering if you can make that real for us. Do you have any examples of what that really looks like of human plus machine equaling something better than just what the machine can do alone or what a human could do alone? Look, there are many examples. If uh, uh, we look at the, uh, for example, what, one thing that is very important in the industry, the performance of these machines, right? Um, you know, like uh, the, the, the paradigm before was like, create the training set, the test set, train the machine, evaluate it, and then whatever performance it gives you, it gives you. Now things are changing. Now we are entering in, a, in the time of active learning where the machine keeps learning over time Humans are providing feedback over time, and this feedback can be explicit or implicit. So the human can actually annotate something, or they can, through their decision, their utilization of the machine output, provide some implicit feedback, right? This happens, for example, I guess, in Google, uh, when you open a website rather than another, the machine will learn that, hey, look, this website was probably most relevant than the other one that I offered. and so. There is a continuous learning. This active learning is, is impressive. We did a lot of experiments also in Bloomberg. And we found out like when, uh, when a large language model came out, uh, everybody was thinking like, oh my God, they will substitute humans. Well, what I can tell you is that they actually, their performance was in the 70%, which is like not uh, exciting at all because uh, we need to deliver products at 95 and above percent. So um, at a certain point we had to ask ourselves how can we do that because you know like the last 10 percent points are very hard to achieve um even for humans so we were thinking like oh what can we do and then we put human in the loop and when the human in the loop enter it was it was incredible we managed to cut the effort significantly uh close to 90 percent of the effort was cut mm -hmm. and the um performance went up by 20%. So we reached that 90, actually 97%, I believe, uh, that we needed. So this, just to give you an idea, and this, this was a continuous interaction. So the model was generating an output. This output was being uh, somehow selected and, or sampled for the technical people, sampled in certain manners so that uh, only the important data points were sent to humans. Humans were controlling those important data points and sending back to the machine and then performance went up and up. So it, it's incredible. Like, and, uh, and this, this took us like a few weeks. Wow. Well, I want to hear more about your specific experiences along this journey, but it's not often that I get to talk to an, a true AI expert. And so I feel like I have to ask the question that's on everybody's mind right now, which is where do you think all of this is going? Um, look, it's a, it's a good question. I believe in, uh, in the long term, so we will have a few phases, right? There will be a phase where we, we will keep being scared of uh, these machines, getting stronger and smarter every day. Um, you know, also our pop culture has uh, uh, trained us to be um, somehow skeptical about this. I love those movies and books too. So yes, yeah, I'm, I'm part true. of it. Exactly. Let's run away from Terminator, right? Uh, and, but uh, uh, so there will be this period and there will be a period where there will be some job displacement. There was some, uh, you know, like some problem in the job market and so on. But then there will be an uh, adaptation period. Humans are uh, probably the um, most advanced species in the world because they are adaptive. They get uh, used to everything. And so we're going to adapt ourselves. We're going to learn what we can do to contribute to this new environment where machines are collaborating with us. And we're going to make the machines able to collaborate with us. So uh, what I expect in the next years is that uh, we have to also, sorry, one, one very important thing. We also, also to think another phenomenon that is ongoing now, the demographic uh, issues that there are, in, especially in the Western countries, right? As the demography goes down, we're going to have a lot of jobs and, and very few people that can actually cover these jobs. Uh, if I think uh, just, I think yesterday or two days ago, there was a news about Italy. Uh, in 2030, uh, there will be, about 2 million jobs without people to perform them. Mm. So if we don't have any, anyone or anything that can substitute these 2 million people that will be missing, then how can we do? 
And when I speak about a million people, I'm speaking about nurses, I'm speaking about uh, doctors, I'm speaking about uh, people that take care of, uh, of our elders. So if we don't replace these jobs with something uh, that, that somehow um, substitutes humans or coordinately collaborate with humans, uh, we, we're going to get in trouble. So this is the thing. The next phase, and I, I close this, sorry, the, the, I answer your question. Oh, I love it. It's not, it's not a one sentence kind of a question. So, yeah. Right, right. And that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a new world that is opening, right? So it's like we are getting there. The new, the new trends that I expect is that we are going towards uh, um, models that will be multimodal, multisensorial, and uh, possibly embodied. So the large language model where we interact uh, through the keyboard will be something that people will laugh at in uh, maybe 20 years from now. Hmm. Um, yeah. I like your, your vision of pointing out some of the challenges that we're facing increasingly that this is going to help us overcome because as much as there's the replacement you know, of humans potentially in some jobs, Really, there's a compliment because there's a growing need and not enough of us working in, in different fields and different areas where this can really help us attack that problem. And there will be jobs that humans are uh, actually better at, right? Like uh, when, when machines will do, uh, will help the elder to stand up from the bed, you know, it's a very difficult, very heavy job. Um, then the human can do something else, can speak with the elder person. And that's, that's where the other person gets the value is from the speaking, not from the, the, the standing up, right? It's like, so there, there's something, we are moving jobs into something that is more meaningful, more valuable for us. I hope so. Where do you think writing, like writing a book falls on that? Because I think of that as an artistic career, a passion. And, and I worry a little bit because I look at it and I sit on weekends and write and I use Bard and ChatGPT and to help and ideate and move things along. And it's fantastic. It's also a little bit scary, honestly, because yeah. that's quite a fulfilling job that it's pretty darn good at in just a year. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid of one thing, that uh, we were born without these models. So you and I um, grew up without using these models and now we can use them as tools. I'm afraid that the new generation that are born with these models mm. won't use them as a tools. We use them as uh, we use the pen. We use them as, um, like an extension of their mind or their body and so on. And if we get there, then it's going to be a problem because they, they won't be the driver of the tool. They will be driven by the tool. So as of today, I believe for us, they are tools as much as, uh, um, I don't know, like, any other tool that artists use. You know, there's Photoshop, like many years ago, people were like, oh my God, it, it, it Photoshop is horrible, blah, blah, blah. But then nowadays, if you go in a, any exhibition, any museums, you see like Photoshopped uh, pictures. It's like mm -hmm. a common thing. Um, it's the human part that you add to the Photoshop. It's the human part that you add to the language models output and so on. Um, I believe this human part needs to be educated. And that's, that's a big issue for the education system, right? In the education system, we have to train our kids to be independent from these models. These models are tools for them. They are not their extension, the extensions of their minds. Hmm. Well, I want to talk about you as the human in this because you, I, I think this first few minutes, I mean, obviously you're passionate about AI. You're extremely knowledgeable about AI. But you said something interesting at the beginning, which is that you found your way here kind of on accident. Uh, and you used the word learning when talking about AI because that's what it's doing. But I'm curious how that role of learning for you, Enrico, has played a role in your journey to accidentally being at the center of public discourse of where businesses and funding and economies are going as well. What did, what did that journey look like for you to learn along the way to be able to speak so knowledgeably about this? Look, um, I can say my life has been a learning experience, like uh, from the very first step. Uh, I come from a small village in uh, Sardinia, uh, in Italy. Uh, and uh, um, my expectations at 16 were to become a waiter. Uh, uh, my expectation is at, at, at 20 were close to that, maybe a professor in uh, middle school. Um, 
and uh, so on. So I started working as a barman. I work in a McDonald's. I entered a certain point in Microsoft, like through a vendor. Uh, I was producing like the grammar checkers for Microsoft. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, how did that happen? That felt like a pretty big jump to go from McDonald's to Microsoft. You know, what what yeah. was that moment like? Yeah. So, uh, you know, like when I was in, uh, I worked in McDonald's when I, I did my Erasmus in London. I spent one year in London, I think 2008, which was also the period where I was familiarizing with this computational linguistics uh, field. And uh, uh, I had to live uh, out of a... Um, scholarship because uh, my parents couldn't afford it and you know I had to work in the weekend to make it happen and so I was working in a McDonald's and I have to tell you the truth I've learned a lot in McDonald's you mm -hmm. cannot imagine how much you can learn in McDonald's they have a very very great organization very great uh, uh, coordination of the processes they have many processes that are ongoing at the same time they have timelines and you know like the deadlines like very very uh, strong deadlines and so on so you can go there and just fry the, the fries. You can do that. Or you can go there, observe and learn. And that's what I did. So I went there. I worked for a whole year for the weekends. And I learned a lot about processes, operations, and so on. And uh, there is also another part of that, in, uh, you know, that is important with leadership. It's the part of uh, uh, rewards. They, in McDonald's reward you a lot if you do, if you do things. I mean, uh, we are talking about... Uh, a uh, humble job, I, I agree. But at the same time, the, the way this humble job is organized really teaches you a lot if you want to learn it. Mm. Um, and so uh, how did I get to Microsoft? Well, um, uh, in that period, I, I, as I say, uh, I was studying at King's College. So I was studying computational linguistics uh, there. And then at a certain point, there was this um, uh, company that was called Lionbridge, which was a vendor at the time for, uh, for Microsoft. And I applied. I remember, and that's funny, um, I was coming from a McDonald's. I don't remember how much was my pay per hour. It was probably five pounds, 75, something like that. Hmm. Um, so when they interviewed me, they told me like, okay, we want to take you. How much do you want? And I say, $9. And they were like, oh, the minimum is $13. I was like, oh, okay, okay, let's do $13. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Three years after, I was the leader of uh, eight teams. Wow. So uh, all the grammar checkers in, uh, um, in so I can tell you that, that, that I started as developer for Italian. I became lead for uh, Portuguese, Brazilian, German, um, Korean, Hungarian. And then they gave me the English one, which is the, of course, the biggest market they have. And I did a grammar checker for, for English. So this happened in... Uh, in the in a range of five six years, wow. and it was a very meritocratic company. They saw that I could contribute, I could give value, and they uh, helped me with that. Of course, my pay increased significantly from the first year <laughs> to the others. But you know, like I came very humble there. I put my energy in it. I put my um, learnings and so on, and then it worked out. And that's what uh, what has directed me afterward. How do you think about just knowing that you're somebody who's passionate about writing, wants to be a writer, you know, like the arts, maybe. And then there's this hard work, hard work ethic, you know, making a, a new life for yourself with higher pay, bigger dreams from what you described in the early days. You know, there's this debate, I feel like, in an advice that goes around on follow your passion and everything else will work out. And then I think there's almost this counter advice, which is find something you're good at and eventually you'll become passionate about it. And I'm curious if you fall on either side or maybe have a different view. And when it comes to career advice for folks out there who are looking to, you know, optimize, certainly me, I'm constantly looking to optimize my career. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, I follow my passion. There's no way I can be successful if I don't follow my passion. I, I did that all my life. I'm very honest with myself. I'm very honest with the people around me. Um, I'm very transparent. Uh, never make up things or, you know, like uh, play the fake face, uh, the poker face or so. No, I'm not that type of person. And that's also a style that I have in leadership, management and so on. I always keep uh, transparency first and so on. Um, I believe that motivated people can 
achieve anything they want. So that's another trait of my leadership. Like when I, when I speak with people, I try to motivate them, to engage them, to empower them, because that's, uh, that's what I believe. That's how I feel myself, right? I'll never be able to do a task under request if I don't like the task, if it goes against my principles, my desires, my ambitions, my determinations, and so on. So I try to live that way. And that's probably why I jumped from, uh, you know, like from, uh, I studied uh, hotel and catering school and then technical school and then literature and then linguistics and so on. I was not looking for, I was looking to grow. Of course, I was ambitious, but uh, I was also following my passions. Yeah. Where do you think that mindset came from that you can achieve anything you put your mind to? Uh, that comes from probably, probably my father. He, is, uh, he has been challenging me since I was a kid, was never very, uh, somehow never happy enough about uh, my performance. <laughs> so mm. uh, it was a way for me to prove to him that I was able to do things. Um, and uh, it was a very tough education, I have to say, from my father on the same and, 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 and as, at the same time, I had my mother who was very supportive. So I, I think I, I had a very good balance between the two, right? My mom supportive. She loved me for the person I was and my father demanding, demanding, demanding. And so uh, having, uh, having this kind of education, I think, uh, uh, moved me in that direction. And then the models, you know, it's very inspiring models. I, have, um, I had an uncle uh, who, is, uh, who is owner of one of the most important restaurants in Luxembourg. So he was like my model and my 16. I had a brother who started in McDonald's like me, and then he became procurement manager for Hewlett Packard. And I had like around me, I had people that, um, you know, were inspiring. So mm. I love the, the, the almost village that you're describing, you know, around you, supporting you mentoring all the different you know words basically that folks can do because i think that's something that sometimes i forget too like when times get hard like oh yeah i'm not alone there's all these people who you know who i yes. have and that that reminder of it takes a village is always true throughout our it lives but it's it's can be hard to remember that sometimes you know like i'm very grateful to the people that that have been around me and i can name all of them if uh, if i had time they are hundreds so um, and I can tell you, like, there, there have been people that support me in many different ways. There's people that have challenged me. They told me, like, you will never make it. Mm. And that, for me, was really the reason why I wanted to make it. When I applied to MIT, I remember I had a call with uh, one girl I was dating at the time. And she told me, you are an anonymous researcher. You will never make it to MIT. And I said, like, why do you say that? And so, like... Because people that get in MIT is people that have like big shoulders, you know, you don't have big shoulders. Mm -hmm. I say, well, let's see. And then I work one year and I got in. So, you know, like you can do whatever you want. If you are passionate, if you have an ambition inside yourself. Mm. How does that affect your leadership style today? I try to communicate that to the people that work with me. We can do everything. I am a very, sometimes a uh, very intense stimulator. Uh, so I'm what does that mean? What's intense? Like, I mean, well, let's do this. Uh, what about we do this? What about we do that? Come on, let's think about this. Let's have a call and let's let's brainstorm together. Let's, you know, it's it's a continue stimulation process. Mm. Um, uh, and the the other thing is that I try to sell my vision. Um, and I try to engage them in my vision. I don't want them to adopt my vision without being part of it. They need to be engaged and empowered in my vision. And then actually, one thing that is very important, like my role um, is uh, very peculiar. I'm not a manager of a team. I don't have a team directly, but I am an influencer. Mm. So I give directions, I give vision and so on. So in this way, for me, it's very crucial to have a very clear vision in my, in my mind, have a certain level of roadmap to achieve that, that, that vision, and then engage people to help me to do that. Hmm. And that's, that's how I work on a daily basis. It's working out so far, so hopefully. <laughs> when you face challenges, what do you do? Because I think influencing, I mean, I have direct reports and 
they're not doing exactly what I say either. You know, like there's no, there's not a magic wand that suddenly makes everything seamless. Their influence is the name of the game. How much you have is how much you can get done. And hopefully you can also be influenced by good ideas around you. And it's not just, you know, constantly. Absolutely. Pushing. It's uh, bi-directional. It's a bi-directional. But when you face a challenge, how do you, how do you influence around it? Depends on the challenge, right? Uh, there are several types of challenge. There are people that are a little bit harder to work with. There are people that have a different vision and they want to go for a different vision and so on. Um, so it happens sometimes that when, they, when it's about a different vision, I try to sit with these people and try to understand the reasons behind the different vision, right? And it happened like very recently that I was wrong. You know, you, you, sometimes we are wrong. Uh, and I wanted to... Uh, push for a convergence of uh, certain uh, ideas, and then I realized maybe it's not a convergence. Maybe it's an integration. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, like convergence and integration are very similar, but they are subtly different. And when I change the term, then we work. Our vision were compatible. So sometimes you have to sit, try to understand why other people are, are like not, you know, in the same. Uh, um, uh, I'd say uh, frequency lamp. Uh, you know, you need to sometimes to 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 coordinate and find that. Um, working with art, uh, uh, you know, there are sometimes conflictual people and so on. That's also another issue. But uh, again, I believe that honesty and transparency, and also you know, having uh, good arguments to defend your vision are mm. crucial because. People tend to be good people, like so. At a certain point, you can convince them if if your vision has really the the fundamentals to to do that. If it doesn't have, then you have to give up. I love you bringing up this time when you were wrong. Thank you for sharing that. That I, I'm guessing is not an easy moment. What did it feel like to to realize? Oh, I've been out there trying to influence this thing, and now I realize that's not exactly the thing that that is correct. Look, it's uh, it, it came easy to be honest, because um, after all, my goal is my vision is a five-year vision, right? So being wrong in one step of the vision, on, uh, you know, in one step to to achieve that vision, is not gonna change the the final, uh, you know, perspective and so on. It it will uh, require some more adaptation around some steps that can take a couple of months more, a couple of months less, you know, like there's a little bit of adaptation on the roadmap. But again, I think transparency and honesty are like the basics of that. Once you, once you have these two and you speak openly and the other person can speak openly with you, give you feedback very straight without uh, being scared that you are judging him or her or whatever, I think things go smooth. So there has been like the, 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 Transition period was hard. It took a few weeks, maybe even a few months. But the moment where we realized that the difference was between convergence and integration, then things start working. Well, I want to commend you for it coming easy, as you say, because those things that you described where folks are willing to give you the feedback, those are not easy things actually to create the culture where that happens. In fact, just yesterday, the episode that went live was talking about how it's lonely at the top. And once you become a leader, you no longer receive feedback and almost end up in an echo chamber, which is kind of a textbook. And I don't have an MBA, but the you know articles that I read, and I'm, that's pretty textbook leadership challenge that you end up following a vision that has little things wrong with it along the way. And you end up in a totally wrong spot going, why didn't anybody tell me that, you know, we were not headed in a good direction, but it happens time and time again. I see it uh, in experiences that I've had. I'm sure you see it with experiences you've had. So while it may have felt like a small, easy thing this time around, just calling out for you that that is an impressive victory in and of itself, because those little moments where you don't get the feedback can compound into really bad situations. Yeah, uh, I agree. I mean, there are challenges. I, I have to say, like, I'm lucky because uh, um, I mean, uh, there is a term ingenuity, I believe, and the pronunciation is that one. So um, sometimes I do things in a, in a very social and human way rather than as a as a leader. 
and that helps me a lot because people feel like more confident to to share their their opinions and ideas and also the the reasons why they don't agree on something mm. I, i'm not a i'm not a leader that has studied out to become a leader i'm i, I just happen to be right so uh, by experience by learning and so on so i think this gives me a little bit the uh, uh, the advantage of speaking openly with people and listening openly. Yeah. Well, at, as we bring our conversation in for a close, I, I think the a question that I'm interested in uh, for myself and for listeners is, you know, what about folks who are interested in AI, but maybe don't know where to begin? They, they feel like they want to take their career in that direction. Do you have any advice for folks on how to get started and, and maybe find themselves into uh, this conversation more than they are today. Yeah. Um, so first thing, uh, the question that they have to ask themselves is how do they want to be engaged into AI, right? Uh, you, do you want to be a software engineer, a machine learning engineer, or you want to be like, a, you know, uh, influencing regulation, or you want to learn the concepts just uh, for speaking with your friends about it? What well, depends on like what level of uh, engagement you want to have in AI and what kind of role do you see uh, for yourself in AI. Uh, I'm saying so because I have experienced this on my own. When I went to MIT, uh, for example, I was, uh, um, I was doing AI, uh, certainly, but from a linguistics perspective. So I was thinking about how to model language. They were already thinking how to create applications for the healthcare or for pharmaceutical and so on. And, and I didn't have that mindset. They were engineers. They were like very strong machine learning engineers that were writing equations on the walls. I didn't see equations in all my life. So, right. So I arrived there and I was like, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe my ex-girlfriend was right. I couldn't make it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but then, you know what happened? One thing. Um, there was a project with a pharmaceutical company, which was failing. And my boss, who is Regina Barzilai, by the way, my, my boss at the time, and she's like one of the most important professors in AI, hmm. she told me, like, fix this thing. And I was like, okay, where to start? Let's have a call with the stakeholders. And I had a call with the stakeholders, and the stakeholders were unhappy. They paid for, for the project. And I asked, why aren't you happy? It's okay. And we start talking. And then I spoke with my colleagues who were very strong machine learning engineers. And my colleagues were telling me, it's not exciting. We don't like this project. We're just like, you know, we're not exciting to that. So there I discovered my leadership role. There I discovered that I shouldn't be another uh, machine learning engineer. I discovered that I should have been the person connecting the stakeholders with mm -hmm. these very smart engineers. I could never compete with those smart engineers. So I found my role, and my role was the connection between the two. I understood all the concepts. I understood the, the user needs, the business needs, and there I found that. So going back to your uh, to your question, depending on the role, uh, reading, uh, listening uh, to uh, talks, um, having also the the, the um, initiative to to try to speak with somebody that is a model for you, right? If somebody is like, if you like a, a machine learning engineer and you want to become like him, why why don't you contact him? Like people right. tend to, or of hair, uh, people tend to be happy if if you are honest uh, and and try to, to you know to learn from them. So why why not? Mentors are very crucial in this in this environment. I love that advice. I think taking a beat to understand where you want to be, and then the process that you described is one where you thought you knew where you wanted to be. And then as you got close to it, you learned, oh, actually, it's a slight pivot to the left. And now I'm where I want to be. <laughs> exactly. 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 And, that, and that's, that's connected to the learning experience that you catch very quickly in, the, in this call. So, yeah. I don't know what this says about me, but when you talk about being intimidated by equations on a board, it reminds me many years ago, I had a new boss and I was in an office with a bunch of you know friends. Uh, and He's, he was coming to visit for the first time, our new big boss. And we thought, well, how do we make a good impression? What should we do? And we're like, let's put equations on the board. And so we Google, you know, really smart equation, write them real big on the board. He walks in and he goes, wow, I can tell a lot of good work's getting done here. We're like, <laughs> just don't ask us what these equations mean, but you bet. <laughs> you bet.
during my thesis, uh, it was something similar. During my thesis, I, I spoke with my, mm, I, was, I was in a call with my professor. And I told him, look, uh, you know, hypernames are like the, the categories of word. For example, dog is an animal, animal is an hypernym. Okay, so we wanted to create an AI system that could identify the hypernames so that you could see that car is a vehicle, dog is an animal, and so on. And uh, I said, like, you know, hypernames must be similar to the, to the element in the category. So the dog and the animal must be similar to each other. But uh, the hypernames should be more general, right? Because it's mm -hmm. above in the hierarchy. And I was thinking, like, more general means that that word is probably going to uh, appear with more words than dog appears with. So mm -hmm. animal is more general, so it appears probably with more words. I didn't know the mathematics of that. This guy came out with like, oh, that's entropy. I was like, entropy, wow, sounds good. What is that? Okay, I send you a formula. Can you implement it? And I was like, okay, why not? You send me a formula. I implemented it. That was my first paper, 2014. It is a paper that now has like several hundred uh, citations. Wow. And it was the one that launched me in the, in the research community. So, I mean, like sometimes the intuitions are coming like this. Uh, I love it. I think this this has been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you for making time out of your busy day to talk with us. You're in the heart of it. So good luck. I can't wait to see where you go and to stay connected throughout. Thanks, Jeff. It was great and uh, very happy. I hope to meet you again. And in Paris, we'll see you next time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You and Nadia, right? Both from Sardinia. I'm guessing that's that's a connection that you knew each other back then as well. Am I right? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, I think she she found me through some, I don't know, maybe newspapers that came out. Oh, no, I know. Another podcast. I was invited in another podcast and uh, she, <laughs> she reached out. Y'all are making the podcast circuit here. That's awesome. Yes. Great job, guys. Uh, continue what you're doing. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Bye. Bye, Enrico.